Um, some of you may be wondering what this guy is. Uh, someone already asked, in fact. Uh, this is a master hacker. It's a cold virus, a common cold virus. And the reason it's so common is that he hacks our innate immune system. We have two main aspects to our immune system, the adaptive, which is specific to uh, particular viruses and parasites, uh, and that's what antibodies are, uh, and that's how vaccines work. They stimulate uh, the production of antibodies. And then there's our innate immune system, which is uh, our basic, our, it's our body's you know, best security practices, our body's firewalls, that sort of thing, our skin, our, uh, um, you know, mucus, uh, tears, the stomach acid, everything that generally protects us from general pathogens. So in our nose, we have uh, cells with little hair-like projections called cilia. They're always um, uh, bringing stuff down into our throat and into our stomach where the acid kills stuff. And this guy hitches a ride on those cilia. He's upside down. Uh, but he doesn't go into the stomach. Once he gets to the back of the throat, he latches onto a receptor uh, called the intercellular adhesion molecule. And this receptor is there. Uh, it's sort of like an open port in a firewall. You need some uh, so that you can actually communicate with other computers. Uh, and our cells need to communicate with each other. This receptor is used for our immune cells to be able to attach when our cells are infected and need help. But this guy just totally takes advantage of that and uses it as an entry into those cells. In fact, some uh, versions of the rhinovirus will upregulate. They'll, they'll instruct the cell to make more of those receptors so that more of them can attach. And so uh, viruses in general, they can't reproduce by themselves. They need to borrow. borrow our cellular machinery, uh, and they have their genetic code, their RNA or DNA, um, and so this guy, when he gets in, he turns the cell into a little virus-making factory. Eventually, the cell ruptures and spreads these things all around and makes more. Of course, eventually, uh, we start feeling symptoms, uh, coughing, sneezing, snot, you know. Um, and these symptoms, research has shown that these symptoms don't help us get better faster from these guys. Uh, we have to wait for antibodies to be made and then they kill them off. Although this is an RNA virus, so it mutates pretty readily, which is why we can get colds over and over again, even though we've made antibodies. Um, but coincidentally, the symptoms really help out the virus because uh, in just a couple drops of mucus, there could be a million of these things. And basically, uh, we're not sick enough to stay home and uh, where we can't spread it around. We, you know, we're just a little bit sick, so we go out uh, and... Uh, you know, we get stuff on our hands, we touch things, and this can survive for several hours on a surface waiting for someone to come along and touch it and then touch their nose, and then they get in and start the whole process over. Uh, so they just, he uses our cilia to get in, our receptors uh, to infect our cells, our cells to make more, and then our symptoms in order to uh, spread. So we've totally been hacked by this common cold. So my name's Jennifer. I'm a pharmacy student. Um, before going into pharmacy, uh, I got a degree in electronic media arts and communications. Um, it's basically a computer art degree. Uh, I did some programming and some web, web development. Um, 
and then I became interested in pharmacy. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about the pharmacy profession before I get into the actual biochemistry hacking. Um, probably a lot of you have this image uh, of pharmacists, you know, the counting pills. I know I did because, uh, is my thing still up there? Yeah. Yeah, okay, good. I can't see it anymore for some reason. It's only, uh, so counting pills. Um, and I have actually had an instructor who said, who, who told us as, uh, you know, pharmacists or students or whatever, not to let any, you know, any media or whatever who's uh, taking pictures of us, uh, to let them uh, take pictures of us counting pills because uh, no matter how many hours of footage or how many pictures they take, uh, it's the counting pills image that they use. Um, pharmacists go to school for at least six years, two years of undergrad and four years of professional school. Uh, so obviously it's a lot more than counting pills. Um, I think, uh, I think pharmacy has, uh, requires a little bit of a hacking perspective. Uh, pharmacists are the experts on the drugs, which there are hundreds now, um, and on treatment, courses of treatment, uh, experts on how, not just how the drugs work, but how they work together, how they work in different patients, why they would be different in different patients. Uh, even things like uh, quality of life issues, uh, figuring out, uh, you know, how to get someone better without having really bad side effects. Uh, even practical things like um, how to deal with missing doses. Uh, so there's some medication management involved, um, which has a problem-solving perspective. I also work in many settings, I should mention, like not just retail, uh, but in the hospital, there's psychiatric, there's poison control. Uh, some people love talking with patients. Uh, some people hate talking with patients and they work weird hours and work with radioactive materials. Uh, and they're called nuclear pharmacists. Uh, I just use this to show the wide variety of, uh, of settings that pharmacists can be in. And uh, I also want to get into a uh, question of like, why does it seem to take so long to count pills? Because you go to the pharmacy and, you know, they're like, come back in 20 minutes and you just had one prescription. That seems really simple. Um, is the slide advancing? And, yeah, okay, just making sure. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, mainly it's your uh, numbers. A lot of uh, places will process hundreds of prescriptions a day. And I would say, imagine if you were at a fast food place and you were ordering a medium fries, but you saw 20 cars ahead of you. Uh, that would, you would expect a long wait, even though it's fast food and it's pretty simple. Uh, people ahead of you might have more complicated orders. Um, but another thing that goes on in pharmacy is that all prescriptions and stuff are checked by the pharmacist before they go out. And sometimes there's only one actual pharmacist on duty. Um, the technicians do most of the filling. Um, you know, but imagine if you had to wait at a fast food place and everything had to ch be checked, double checked by the manager. Um, it wouldn't be desirable in fast food because it would really slow things down. But in pharmacy, it's very important to get it right. Uh, and the pharmacist is also often interrupted a lot. Uh, you know, lots of phone calls um, to doctors. Uh, you know, doctors and nurses will often consult with pharmacists, uh, you know, finding out what's best. Uh, you know, insurance companies, even though the expertise is not in insurance. Uh, so there's a lot that goes on. It gets pretty busy. Uh, but now I want to get into some actual chemistry. Uh, don't know which one. Oh, yes. All right. <laughs> uh, sometimes, like, if you go to a drugstore and you get your cold prescription, I mean, your even over-the-counter stuff, 
you might look at the ingredients and see, you know, pseudoephedrine, HCL, dextromethorphan, HBR, uh, you know, the name of the drug followed by some, uh, you know, sodium or citrate or HCL. Um, and why is this? I used to wonder, um, then from the title of the slide, uh, you know, this uh, has to do with solubility. Uh, solubility is important um, because it affects how the drug is absorbed, how it's distributed, and how it's excreted. Um, and this is something we can manipulate uh, with chemistry. So uh, some basic chemistry, uh, just because uh, I don't assume you have any uh, background, chemistry is all mainly about magnets. And uh, you have, uh, I have to check the slide. I <laughs> can't see it. Yeah, all right. So like, you know, you have protons and electrons. Uh, protons are in the atom nucleus and they're a positive charge. And electrons are yeah, negatively charged. Um, with the uh, carbon, uh, there's, I have four, well, the carbon has six protons and it has six electrons, so it's neutral. Um, two of those electrons are happy and paired and near the nucleus. And then there's four on the outer level. Uh, and they're unpaired. And they're not all that happy all by themselves out there. With oxygen, uh, there's six. And there's two that are paired and happy, but there's two that are unpaired. And you can imagine if they get together, they can share. Uh, make a pair of electrons as long as they share them. And these electrons are on the valence, so it's called a covalent bond. And in chemistry, when you see a line, like on the bottom uh, with the methane, it represents a pair of electrons. On the top, I have the pairs actually drawn as dots, but usually they're drawn as lines. Um, and that's what the bond is. Um, in the case of uh, water, over to the right, um, it's a little different than carbon. It has two bonds, but then it has those two lone pairs of electrons out there, which affect its magnetism. Um, the magnetism also is affected uh, by the oxygen itself being bigger. It attracts the electrons more closely to it than, uh, than to the hydrogens. So those electrons are closer to the oxygen. There's more of a negative charge close to the oxygen, and there's a little bit of a positive charge uh, near the hydrogen, which makes this polar. There's a difference in charge. And on the methane, the electrons are more like in between the carbon and hydrogen, so it's nonpolar. Uh, so things that, are, that have this polarity will tend to dissolve in water. Um, you know, another picture of water, uh, whereas things that are nonpolar, like, you know, methane and oil and stuff, will not mix with water, and they'll only dissolve in nonpolar solvents. But we can manipulate that with some acid and base. Acids basically are, uh, are molecules that can donate a proton. Uh, which is the same as a hydrogen without an electron. And it's got a, it's positively charged, um, and bases can accept an uh, accept a proton. Um, and if you imagine, um, so I believe we have HCl on that slide, um, and uh, you know NaOH, sodium hydroxide. The HCl is a strong acid. Uh, when dissolved in water, it'll dissociate. The chlorine will hang on to those electrons, and it's all happy and, you know, stable and nice. Uh, and the hydrogen uh, is uh, promiscuous and will go attach itself to any pair of electrons it can find. Um, in the case of the base, again, like the hydroxide, the, well, the sodium is happy but the hydroxide is ready to be reactive and uh, grab onto any uh, hydrogens. Um, 
So uh, those are strong acids and bases. Uh, here we have a couple of weak, weaker ones. Uh, in the case of ammonia, that nitrogen, because it has that lone pair of electrons, it's got a little bit of a negative charge sticking out there, and it will accept a proton. Uh, the thing on the bottom is acetic acid. It's in vinegar, um, and it will give up that electron, or the, that proton that's on the lower right. Um, and something to notice here is that on the left, with the ammonia, the ammonia is basic, it can accept a, pro a proton, um, but on the right, it's acidic. It's its conjugate acid form. It, it has an extra proton that it could give away, uh, and it exists in equilibrium. It could go back and forth depending. If there's a whole excess of protons, it'll keep the proton. Um, it'll stay in its acid form in acidic media. Um, but if you put it in more basic media, it'll kind of revert to a more basic form. And this can be important because the acidic conjugate is charged, um, and the non-acidic one is not. And the same with the acetic acid. Uh, on the left, it's in acid form, and the right, it's on base form, and the base form is charged. Now, both of these molecules are uh, pretty polar, and they're, they're soluble in water, uh, you know, whether charged or uncharged. Uh, but the next one, is uh, much more nonpolar. It doesn't necessarily uh, want to dissolve in water unless it is charged. Um, and so this takes a little bit of a uh, hacker vision here. When a hacker, yeah, like if you look at a URL and you're trying to manipulate a website with a database. Uh, one of the first things, you know, your eyes might just zoom to that query line where, where you could put in a SQL injection. The rest doesn't really matter, you know, what the pages are named or anything. Uh, you know, you just go straight to the vulnerable point. And the same is true in chemistry, uh, you know, especially organic chemistry. Um, those nitrogens are places that could accept a proton. And as we know, that can be used to manipulate charge, which can manipulate solubility. Um, so some of you may be wondering what this is. It's not a mana potion. <laughs> you really wouldn't want to drink it. It would not taste very good. It's uh, two layers of vinegar and turpentine. And they mix about as well as oil and water. The vinegar is polar, uh, and the turpentine is nonpolar. It's used as a paint thinner. Um, and in the vinegar layer on the bottom, I have uh, well, I have some yellow food coloring, and I have some blue dye from a Sharpie pen. And the blue dye is a molecule that's much like uh, the one on the screen. Um, and right now it's dissolved in the vinegar because it's in acidic media, it's charged. Um, but here I have some soda ash. And let's see, I hope I can do this without making too much of a mess. Soda ash is much like baking soda. Whoops. <laughs> I do a paper towels. <laughs> I should have poured that in so fast. I'm sorry. <laughs> 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 sorry. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna make a mess. Check the electronics. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I'm not. Uh, it's uh, not sure exactly. Uh, it's a little bit more basic than baking soda. Yeah. yeah. I'd have to look it up. I don't. I don't remember these structures a lot of times. Sodium. Oh yeah. It's. I think soda ash is 
sodium carbonate where oh it's a washing soda no. yeah yeah whereas baking soda sodium baking soda is sodium bicarbonate right yeah um so anyway the it fizzed up uh because the soda ash is basic and uh it neutralized all the vinegar uh it also affected the dye um we still have some in the bottom here dissolved in the vinegar but most of the blue went up into the turpentine layer. Uh, that's because it changed. That's because the, the base pulled the uh, proton off of the dye and it became uh, nonpolar. Uh, so it went, stopped being soluble in vinegar and went to the uh, turpentine. And The actual dye used in Sharpie pens is a trade secret. Uh, however, uh, by observing this, you can tell, or I can tell, that uh, it has certain properties. Um, obviously, it has uh, an acid-base nature, so that it can be, um, you know, it can be charged or not charged. Whereas the one on the right um, is permanently charged. It's got four bonds on the uh, nitrogen, it's not acidic, not basic. Its solubility cannot be manipulated. So we know that the dye is something like the one on the left and not like the one on the right. Yeah, I, I spent some time uh, exploring or trying to find some different dyes I could use and this was the most accessible one that worked. Yeah, um, what he's saying, just uh, so people know, he's mentioning azo dyes, um, which are a different uh, chemical structure, um, but might also be interesting to explore. Um, so, on to more like less chemistry, chemistry, and more hacking our own biochemistry. Uh, how do painkillers work? I've been asked this question a few times. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's pretty obvious with an anesthetic that totally numbs you, that like, of course, you don't feel anything, so of course you don't feel pain. Um, but how does like, you know, ibuprofen, aspirin, naproxen, you know, you'll, like if you spend a day helping your friend move and you're really sore the next day, um, then you you can take a ibuprofen or whatnot and you know, you'll feel better, no more pain. But if someone comes and punches you in the face, you'll still feel, <laughs> you'll still feel it. No matter how much ibuprofen you took. Uh, and that's because there uh, are different kinds of pain nerves. Um, we've got uh, one, ones like this that have uh, those yellow cells on them. Back one slide. Oh, okay, good. Thanks. Um, those cells uh, speed up transmission. So those are very fast. These are the, uh, you know, you get punched in the face, you feel it. Uh, nerves. Um, there are also nerves that are much slower and uh, and they respond to uh, chemicals called prostaglandins. Um, prostaglandins are synthesized on site in response to injury. Um, they're pretty important for uh, uh, for repair. Uh, they dilate blood vessels um, which, you know, the blood gets in, it brings nutrients and stuff and what you need to repair. Um, it, it heats up the area, which speeds up chemical reactions to help you heal faster. It can be used, it can be uh, immobilizing, used as a scaffolding to, uh, you know, prepare the site for healing. And it also causes pain. Uh, and we, we don't like pain very much. Uh, the pain tells us that we're hurt and, uh, when you say, yeah, yeah, we know, I'm just going to take the ibuprofen. Um, so the prostaglandins are pretty short-lived, um, and they decay quickly. So they're just synthesized when we need them. And they're synthesized by a, a chemical called, or an enzyme, I'm sorry, uh, called cyclooxygenase. 
So like you can imagine if we inhibit cyclooxygenase, keep it from doing its job, uh, we'd stop feeling the pain. Uh, now there are two kinds, um, COX-1 and COX-2. Uh, you know, COX-1 is the good type, which it's protective for the GI tract. Um, and it's not associated with pain. Uh, COX-2 makes the prostaglandins that are uh, painful to us. And most of these uh, you know, over-the-counter pain medications like aspirin and ibuprofen, are uh, they inhibit both of these. Uh, so they stop the pain, but they classically have a problem where uh, they hurt our uh, stomach, have used for a long time, and can even induce ulcers. Um, we even, there are prescription ones too. Uh, there's a really potent one we use in hospitals sometimes called Keteralac, and, uh, and it's really potent. It's as potent as morphine killing pain, but uh, it can only be used for a very short time because it's so bad uh, for the GI tract if you use it for very long. Um, and so a few years ago, uh, some people came up with the brilliant idea of, I know, uh, let's, only inhibit the bad one. And usually this is, usually selectivity uh, in a drug is a good thing because they'll have fewer side effects, uh, you know, usually, and, um, and it's more targeted to what we want to do. Uh, unfortunately, our biochemistry in a lot of ways is like old code. I don't know if you've had the pleasure of working on old code before, uh, you know, stuff that has been written uh, stuff that's written on top of other stuff that's not necessarily related or attached on or has clues, and you go and try to uh, change something and it changes something that's seemingly unrelated. Um, and so these uh, COX-2 inhibitors came out, uh, Vioxx, Bextra, and Celebrex, uh, and two of them have been withdrawn from the, from the market, especially Vioxx, because they caused heart problems. Um, and uh, I remember wondering, well, how could this be? How could, uh, you know, Vioxx, it, it, it does less than ibuprofen does, and Vioxx is bad for your heart, but ibuprofen isn't. Uh, so I looked into this, and actually, because of uh, this, we figured out that ibuprofen can actually be bad for your heart. Um, now, I'm not talking about a one time, like you got a headache or you're sore or whatever, um, you know, uh, taking it. Um, this is what happens, uh, or this becomes a problem with daily use with patients with arthritis and things like that that are taking it all the time. Um, ibuprofen, or well, there's a spectrum of how selective these all are, and ibuprofen's kind of in the middle. Um, it's not the worst, uh, you know, Vioxx was the worst. Um, and the best are naproxen and aspirin. They're the least selective, um, and aspirin is cardioprotective. Um, but they're the worst for your stomach. Um, uh, the mechanism isn't clearly understood, but it seems that both COX-1 and COX-2 affect the blood vessels and uh, COX-1 in, uh, encourages clotting, um, and COX-2 balances that out. So if you take out just the COX-2 without taking out the COX-1, um, then, uh, then you have more, uh, you know, strokes and heart attacks and other problems like that. Um, so that's an interesting lesson about side effects. Uh, Going on, um, I'm not going to talk about Tylenol uh, much. It's got its own unique mechanism, which is not fully understood. Um, I did want to mention opioids. Um, opioids uh, don't work on the, they don't inhibit inflammation. They work on the central nervous system, uh, which is your spinal cord and your brain. And this is because the body, the body has a lot of mechanisms to do different things when it needs to, uh, you know, obviously it can make us feel pain. It can also uh, modulate pain, and the opioids work on that system to, uh, to modulate pain. Um, they've also got some central nervous system side effects, or side effects like euphoria, um, nausea, respiratory depression, 
um, which people get tolerant to. So it's not, it can be use limiting, um, but it's not too bad. Uh, they also inhibit cough. Um, and they've also got some peripheral effects. Uh, you know, constipation is a big one. Um, people don't get tolerant to the constipation, unfortunately, and that could be uh, really use limiting. Yeah, they get tolerance to, uh, yeah, pain relief, uh, you know, to a lot of the, you know, central effects, um, and a lot of the peripheral effects, but not the constipation. Uh, but I wanted to note that uh, another thing about side effects, sometimes they're not always bad. Um, I'm sure you've uh, probably seen Imodium, uh, loperamide. It's also an opiate. It works on the same opioid receptors as morphine and the others. <laughs> yeah. uh, and uh, we use it uh, for diarrhea because like, it has the same constipating effect. The thing is, um, it's kept out of the central nervous system, so it only has the peripheral effects. Um, and it's kept out by, uh, partly because it doesn't cross, a lot of it doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier. Our, uh, our uh, blood vessels that go to our central nervous system are uh, the most selective of what they let in. It's sort of like some things on your computer, you want only you know, administrators or super users to be able to access, and it's sort of similar uh, with our bodies. Um, uh, we also have another defense, um, and that's a uh, peak glycoprotein. It's an enzyme that will pump stuff out. Uh, so any loperamide that gets in uh, will be pumped out by this uh, peak glycoprotein. Um, the thing is, like another thing, you know, I mean, pharmacists have to watch out for uh, interactions. Um, uh, there aren't a whole lot of peak glycoprotein inhibitors. Um, there's one called quinidine. And, uh, and it's been observed that if someone is on quinidine, uh, they can uh, experience central effects from loperamide, such as respiratory depression. Um, so there's an interaction there that we have to be careful with. Uh, of course, probably uh, the next uh, you know, thing you might wonder is it's possible to get high off of Imodium if you were taking one of these PGP inhibitors. Uh, it seems that I tried to find out, you know, through research, uh, <laughs> not personal research. There isn't a lot of personal research out there, but there are a few who have posted to the internet. Uh, it basically said, this is crap. <laughs> but... <laughs> He says, uh, you might have shot if you inject it directly in, because then uh, it gets all in there. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, uh, you know, it would be easier to socially engineer someone to give you just... <laughs> yeah. Um, Tramadol. Yeah. Tramadol is a synthetic uh, painkiller that is unique. It's a it's a pseudo opioid. It works partly on opioid receptors and it also works on uh, neurotransmitters, serotonin, norepinephrine, and uh, it's kind of weird, but it tries to balance out, um, you know, all the effects. Yeah, it can have some of the same side effects. Um, you know, as far as low paramide, I've, I have found out that uh, it uh, is, it does other, it's not just through opioid receptors that it helps with the diarrhea. Um, so it would take a, it's not that potent at, uh, you know, not as potent with the sheer opioid effects as, like, you know, that. And interestingly too, uh, it has a metabolite that 
uh, we suspect might be neurotoxic to the brain. Um, this never is a problem uh, with the uh, with actual regular use of it because it doesn't get in there. Um, and we don't really know for sure because uh, we don't have anybody who's like injected themselves with it. Uh, but it is interesting to note. <laughs> um, a couple other uh, drugs with interesting side effects. Uh, minoxidil, it was developed as a uh, vasodilator. Uh, uh, dilate blood vessels and help with blood pressure, uh, but it had this uh, uh, annoying side effect of extra hair growth. Uh, so now, uh, if you were um, you know, watching any TV in the early 90s, you probably saw a bunch of commercials for Rogaine, and they didn't tell you what it is on those commercials, but it was uh, if you were going bald and you wanted to grow more hair, and that's minoxidil. That's uh, what it's really marketed for now. Uh, another one is sildenafil, uh, also developed as a vasodilator for blood pressure. Uh, and it dilates blood vessels. Uh, it turns out it's a little uh, more selective uh, than, it's better known as Viagra. So, let's see where we are. <laughs> Yeah, last section. Uh, I'll kind of how this hacking mentality, this hacking perspective, uh, can help us with drug design. Um, so let's hack something. Uh, heartburn is a condition you get, uh, you know, painful in your chest when uh, some stomach acid gets up into your throat. And uh, you know, if you get it occasionally, you can pop some tums that neutralizes the acid. Uh, or you could take a uh, one of the over-counter uh, heartburn antihistamines um, that slows down the acid production in your stomach a little bit. Um, but chronic heartburn can need something more powerful, and uh, chronic heartburn could be you know caused by reflux disease or ulcers, and uh, and it can be very damaging if it's not treated. Um, so we want to treat it. Uh, and uh, the best way we know how right now is to uh, slow down acid production of the stomach. Uh, acid is produced in parietal cells in the stomach, and uh, there are several pathways, several things that stimulate acid production, including a particular type of histamine receptors get stimulated, um, and you know, but that's only one part. Uh, there's gastrin, acetylcholine. Um, so to stop all acid production, we have to target the proton pump. And this is a backdoor job because uh, it would be very difficult to get a drug into the stomach through the mucus uh, down into where the parietal cells are and still have it like, you know, be able to bind to the proton pump and not bind to anything else on the way. Um, so we have to, uh, uh, come in through the back door, and it can't be active until it gets there because uh, we don't want it doing anything on the way. We have to uh, have a drug that goes uh, through the stomach into the intestine, gets absorbed into the bloodstream, uh, and then it's somehow activated when it gets to the parietal cells. Uh, I believe we have a picture of omeprazole here. This is a proton pump inhibitor. And I'm not going to get into every nitty-gritty piece of chemistry involved in this, in the design of this molecule. Uh, but I will mention one of the key things, the uh, first key thing is the sulfur. Because uh, the proton pump is a protein, and a good way to target proteins, we want to make a strong bond to it. And there's an amino acid uh, called cysteine that has a sulfur, and it's uh, susceptible to making uh, covalent uh, disulfide bonds. So by using sulfur to bind, we can bind irreversibly uh, and really uh, have something potent to knock out that pump. Um, and but the sulfur, as it is right now, is uh, you know the molecule's happy kind of staying the way it is uh, until it gets in a very acidic environment and 
where is there an acidic environment? Uh, the parietal cell, which is pumping acid into the stomach. Uh, so it's really kind of clever. Um, the, the protons all uh, uh, attach to the uh, nitrogen in the lower right. Um, and now that part of the molecule is charged. And the nitrogens on the other side of the sulfur get really excited. And they, um, parts of the molecule all attack itself. And basically, this molecule rearranges itself uh, in such a way that the, uh, the sulfur is now, like, it's not very stable, and the sulfur is sticking out there, ready to go, ready to bind. And by this time, it's right where it should be in the cell, and it'll bind to the proton pump and knock it out. And uh, it takes, we, our body pretty much has to replace it uh, in order to start making, uh, in order to make as much acid, and that takes a couple weeks. Um, so it takes a while for this to work. Um, they only knock out a very small percentage of the pumps, but it can have a very potent effect, and it can be extremely helpful for people with uh, heartburn problems and really allow them to heal. And if they have a ulcer, a uh, infection of H. pylori, uh, they can be put on a course of antibiotics uh, in conjunction with these and be cured. Um, so uh, we have hacked for health, and I believe I'm on the last slide here. <laughs> um, I'm going to be uh, in the Morse room tomorrow to just to answer questions because I figured I might not have much time tonight. Uh, but that's the end of my presentation. And uh, any questions? <laughs> Yeah, no tropics. Um, I remember they were kind of like, there was research on them a few years ago, and as far as I know, the research really didn't turn up much that was exciting. Like ginkgo, um, you know, didn't turn out to be all that helpful uh, for people's memory and stuff. Uh, you know, I mean, there are some, uh, you know, uh, supplements out there and stuff that do so, do some things, but most of them are not really researched yet. Uh, you know, so uh, I don't know, keep asking your pharmacist. <laughs> So do uh, so your doctor uh, suggesting taking ibuprofen regularly to uh, help heal if you have a injury that is? Could you repeat that or rephrase it? Or? Um, usually, it's for some kind of bruise, often near a bone. The type of bruise that would normally be slow to heal, um, and they say take ibuprofen every day, and that will help it. Uh, okay. Um, well, our, our uh, you know, processes, in, inflammation is obviously a part of healing, uh, but there are also cases where it can be, uh, where it can impede healing uh, because it, uh, you know, brings a lot of blood into the area. Um, but sometimes, uh, you know, sometimes this is counterproductive. It's too much or there's too much inflammation and it gets in the way of itself. I mean, our, the, our body does the best job it can. Uh, you know, your doctor can or probably knows more about um, exactly which kinds of conditions would be better to uh, keep the inflammation down. Um, so that's about what I know. <laughs> so this is more of a comment, but if you are interested in no nootropics, brain hacking, or improving cognition, come talk to me later. I will agree with you as far as um, 
what you were saying with ginkgo biloba not doing much by itself. However, there are a number of compounds that do improve memory specifically, and ones that are more heavily researched. Uh, galantamine hydrobromine, which is marketed under the name Reminil, is probably mm -hmm. the best commercial example, but there are a number of especially acetylcholine donors that will have benefits. Um, I guess my question was more, with the improvement that we see in terms of technology and communication, do you see some of these drugs becoming more accessible to the lay audience being able to experiment with themselves, that N minus, or N equals one size experimentation, and do you see that affecting your business in the future? Um, I'm not sure what you mean by the uh, last part, the uh, being more accessible, uh, could you rephrase that? Basically, internet equals communication. It means that right. it's no longer me trying fun stuff in a corner, but now I can communicate and go, hey, you know, if I try this, it ends up giving X result to me. How mm -hmm. does that work? But do you see that sort of trend where information being more distributed to the masses, sort of reducing some of the power that pharmacists and doctors have over the control of fun and interesting yeah. compounds? Uh, well, I, I mean, it's it's a interesting thing. I do think um, you know the internet and the spread of information uh, can have a very big effect. I don't think it, it at all um, you know uh, is a threat to the power of pharmacists. Um, I think it's it's a real opportunity for pharmacists. Actually, uh, as we evaluate, there's more and more things out there, and you know as far as uh, I you know, like memory improvement and stuff. I like to uh, keep an open mind. When there's not much research on something yet, uh, we really don't know. Uh, although I will say that um, that there are a lot of trends out there that may not have any merit, and uh, and it can be difficult for someone if their friend just says, "Oh, this worked," you know, and <laughs> this is great, and and like, you know, it could all be placebo and. There you know, may or may not be research out there that uh, shows how well it does or doesn't work. Um, uh, I mean, overall, I like the flow of information, and I think it can be very empowering to patients. Um, and that will probably change uh, the way healthcare is done. Um, but I don't see it, I just see it as empowering overall, uh, although. Uh, it also makes things more complicated for pharmacists, uh, especially in if we if someone comes in with the uh, like, oh, I heard by you know taking mega doses of you know vitamin E, my you know skin will not be wrinkled anymore. Uh, things that have uh, you know no evidence whatsoever for them, and uh, you know trying to explain to people, no, that's that's not what works for that. Uh, but it's, I mean, overall, I do find it exciting, at least. <laughs> hmm. This is not much of a question. It's a little interesting aside and sort of a tie-in, because you, you, you brought up the cold virus and you brought up aspirin. Now, obviously, aspirin may help you feel better, but it turns out that from studies they did in Lancet, among other places, well, they posted them in Lancet, they mm -hmm. discovered that, interestingly enough, because it affects the prostaglandin system, it also affects your immune system. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that if you, when they took volunteers and they checked the live virus, the, the concentration in the nasal secretions, people who used aspirin had a higher level of them and they were there longer, which mm -hmm. means maybe you're feeling a little better, but you're actually have your cold longer, at least with mm -hmm. aspirin, I don't know about any of the others. Kind of an interesting point there. When you think about yeah. it. That can happen. I mean, I uh, I don't know about that specific case. Um, I know there. Are... It can be looked up. It's out there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Another thing, of course, was fever. If it's minor, you may be better off not treating it because yeah. your body functions better immunity-wise with a slight fever. Yeah, I've definitely had some uh, uh, you know instructors talk about why uh, you know you might not necessarily want to treat a low fever. It is. Uh, helpful for your body to uh, clear out a lot of infections. Um, just first of all, my nootropic of choice is uh, coffee. Um, <laughs> one of the questions that I had, um, or sort of a, an angle on the connection between um, pharmacy tech or pharmacy and um, 
hacking is intellectual property law. And in this country, at least, you can uh, patent molecules. You can't patent backbones or active sites yet, but um, mm -hmm. there are countries, uh, specifically India and Brazil, that have allowed under um, health crisis exceptions uh, for countries to produce uh, medications that are otherwise um, <clears throat> covered by patent in the U.S. and uh, signatory countries. Um, at generic prices. So specifically HIV drugs um, from India are being manufactured by, you know, people who go to the same colleges, the same sort of industrial chemistry and, and biotech colleges as, you know, the people who make the same drugs here. But they're available much, much cheaper and I wondered if that was something you would want to talk about. <laughs> well, I have read, you know, about, a, uh, I mean, international issues can, with patents can get, Complicated, and in some cases, uh, you know, in India, they've even ignored drug patents, um, and it's really hard to say what a good solution is. I mean, uh, you know, are the drug companies going to go over there and try to stop them? I mean, can they? Um, yeah, you know, I, I don't really know what's going to happen with that exactly. Uh, although, on a, a slight tangent, uh, I did read. Um, recently about uh, some drug companies banding together uh, to research malaria uh, on the grounds that it's a uh, neglected uh, disease, it's mainly third world, you know, uh, problem with audience that doesn't have a lot of, you know, income like we do up here. And so to reduce the cost of researching it, the drug companies are going to develop their own drugs individually, but they're going to share all their research um, in order to market to this uh, third world market, which is very interesting. Um, quick one. Uh, you were talking about aspirin probably being the best painkiller um, just because of the less side effects. I was wondering about uh, acetaminophen, um, if, what, how it rates on that scale. And then also, uh, one other quick question is, um, if you could, have you heard about, uh, they did a study where they showed that basically because um, these painkiller, uh, I think the NSAID category, mm -hmm. yeah, the, um, the brain circuitry of so social rejection is, shares the pain circuitry. And so they did a study that showed um, social rejection, like pain, you know, your feelings basically being hurt could be lessened by that, but then there's been controversy around that, people saying that, you know, there's different areas, and so what are your thoughts on that, if you've heard about it or just from hearing about it now? Mm -hmm. uh, well, as far as the second part, um, I haven't heard that about the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories specifically. Um, I have heard in cases of chronic pain uh, that it's definitely can be connected with emotional pain uh, and, you know, especially uh, clinical level depression. Um, and there could be multiple reasons for that. It's obviously no fun to be in pain chronically. Uh, and, uh, you know, there can be disability involved, but there could also be something biochemically involved. Um, as far as aspirin, like, I don't think it's, you know, the best painkiller because it's the worst for your stomach. Um, it just happens to be uh, the best for your heart out of those, uh, you know, uh, NSAIDs. Uh, and um, as far as acetaminophen, acetaminophen is pretty good because um, because it doesn't, uh, you know, hurt your stomach or your heart or anything. Um, it can hurt your liver if you take a lot of it, or if you take, uh, like a lot of people get themselves into trouble because they uh, will take cold preparations that they don't know it has acetaminophen in it, and then they also take acetaminophen, and they do this for several days, and it builds up and, uh, and damages their liver. Um, it's not inflammatory. Right, it also, it does not uh, bring down inflammation. It works through a different mechanism. Um, you know, so for some things might not be as effective, um, you know, and if you have a problem with inflammation specifically too, it's not going to be helpful. <laughs> uh, 
Do you have any suggestions for offline or online resources for uh, just general information like solubility or metabolization or anything like that for various things? Um, yeah, good question. I'd have to think about it because there are uh, so many. And of course, right now, personally, I'm using uh, resources that are you know, through my school a lot. There are more professional resources. Uh, I mean, honestly, I, I do go to Wikipedia a lot. I've learned enough that there are some articles that I have changed because I'm like, what? what? <laughs> uh, although a lot of the information, given what it is, is pretty good. Um, so, I mean, especially like chemical data, like solubility uh, is standardized. Uh, and they'll list that on Wikipedia. You can find it from other sources too, like, uh, you know, uh, books in the library and reference sources. Um, PubMed, yeah, that's a good one. Um, usually you come up with individual, uh, you know, um, studies. And on there, like, it's very useful, but it can be hard to uh, see the whole picture with some things. Um, but yeah, it's definitely a good one. Um, Hippocrates, yeah. CRC online. Oh, uh, I don't know. Yeah. So I think I'm about uh, out of time here. Um, so thank you all for coming. And if you have more questions, uh, you can see you in the room, uh, the unscheduled room tomorrow morning. Thank you.